Our next speaker is Mr. Lou Rockwell. Mr. Rockwell is the president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, and he's here to talk about his new book, The Left, the Right, and the State. Lou? The Left, the Right, and the State, three of my least favorite things. <laughs> Well, it's uh, great to be here in this lineup talking about this subject uh, just at a, a moment when, we, when we've moved from a regime of fascism and socialism to one of socialism and fascism. <laughs> I, I do want to thank, uh, publicly thank Judy Thomason for saving me from the original title of this book. Uh, the dedication page, I mentioned Mises is great, um, a motto adopted as a boy from Virgil, Tune Cadi Malis Set Contra. Identi or Ito, that is, do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it. So the original title of this book was Tune Kedi Malus, and Judy said, uh, yeah, <laughs> So the, the present title is the former subtitle, and of course, uh, far better. I'm just going to read the introduction, the short introduction to this book, and then uh, take questions if you have any. In American political culture, and world political culture too, the divide concerns in what way the state's power should be expanded. The left has a laundry list, the right does too. Both represent a grave threat to the only political position that is truly beneficial to the world and its inhabitants, liberty. What is the state? It is that group within society that claims for itself the exclusive right to rule everyone under a special set of laws that permit it to do to others what everyone else is rightly prohibited from doing, namely, aggressing against person and property. Why would any society permit such a gang to enjoy an unchallenged legal privilege? Here is where ideology comes into play. The reality of the state is that it is a looting and killing machine. So why do so many people cheer for its expansion? Why indeed do we tolerate its existence at all? The very idea of the state is so implausible on its face that the state must wear an ideological garb as a means of compelling popular support. Ancient states had one or two, they would protect you from enemies, and they, or they were uh, ordained by the gods. To a greater and lesser extent, all modern states still employ these rationales, but the democratic state in the developed world is more complex. It uses a huge range of ideological rationales parsed out between left and right that reflect social and cultural priorities of niche groups, even when many of these rationales are contradictory. The left wants the state to, to redistribute wealth, to bring about equality, to rein in business, to give workers a boost, to provide for the poor, protect the environment. I address many of these rationales in this book with an eye towards particular topics in the news. The right, on the other hand, wants the state to punish evildoers, to boost the family, to subsidize upright way, way, ways of living, to create security against foreign enemies, to make the culture cohere, and to go to war to give ourselves a sense of national identity. I also address these rationales. So how are these competing interests resolved? They log roll and call it democracy. The left and the right agree to let each other give to have their way, provided nothing is done to injure the essential interests of the other. The trick is to keep the balance. Who is in power is really about which way the log is rolling. And there you have the modern state in a nutshell. Although it has ancestors in such regimes as Lincoln's and Wilson's, the genesis of the modern state is in the interwar period, when the ideas of a laissez-faire society fell into disrepute, the result of the mistaken view that the free market brought us economic depression. Sounds familiar. So we had the New Deal, which was a democratic hybrid of socialism and fascism. The old liberals were nearly extinct. The US then fought a war against the totalitarian state, allied to a totalitarian state and the winner was Leviathan itself. Our Leviathan doesn't always have a chief executive 
who struts around in military costume. But he always enjoys powers that the Caesars of old would envy. The total state today is more soothing and slick than it was in its interwar infancy, but it is no less opposed to the ideals advanced in these pages. How much further would the state have advanced, however, had Mises and Rothbard and many others not dedicated their lives to freedom. We must become the intellectual dissidents of our time, rejecting the demands for statism that come from left and right, and we must advance a positive program of liberty, which is as radical, fresh, and true as it ever was. Thank you. So let me... <laughs> Have any questions, or is everybody ready for lunch? Yes. Yeah, seeing Barack Obama said on leaders at unprecedented, unprecedented levels of bailouts, how did you see the depression there? Well, you know, I, I keep thinking that we're in uncharted waters. I mean, at least in the 1930s, there was still a partial gold standard. I mean, there were some restraints on the central bank. Never, of course, in human history have we been in a situation in which the central, no central bank was restrained and that they all have an entirely discretionary monetary policy. And we've seen the US Central Bank create, we don't entirely know, but more than probably $9 trillion uh, in new money since, since the crisis began. Um, seems like, Chris, as we know, Bush and Obama are duplicating the policies of Hoover and Roosevelt, uh, but building on a much bigger state, much more interventionist. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it seems to me, you know, at, at, at my worst moments, I think they're actually capable of preventing a recovery from ever taking place. Uh, on the other hand, as Frank Shostak argues, um, if we be, when we begin to have a recovery, and my, my guess is he's right, uh, that then the banks will disgorge their reserves. It's a wonderful moment when the banks all seem Rothbardy and they're all running practically 100% reserves. Uh, <laughs> But at that moment, the banks begin to disgorge their reserves, and then he says, we have hyperinflation very, very quickly. Um, so, so, you know, you don't know which, you know, t t it, it seems like we have uh, two bad alternatives. Um, but they put us into a very, you know, a very bad situation. And um, it seems like, to me, like they've, you know, in, so, in some sense, even before our eyes, moving from, from crazy Keynesianism, as bad as that is, to socialism. And certainly there are many totalitarian impulses in this bunch. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I must say I found it hard to believe there could be anybody worse than Bush. But, of course, there is. It's always the next guy. Who was it who said that sooner or later every president makes you nostalgic for his predecessor? <laughs> Took a short, a short time in this case. Not that I think that Bush wouldn't have bailed out everything and and uh, run a crazed Keynesian policies too. After all, Greenspan and Bernanke are his appo appointees. I mean, he's, he comes from the conservative Keynesianism of the Republican Party that has characterized the Republican Party, um, I guess, always, except the op when they were in opposition against Roosevelt, it would, didn't characterize them. But in power, it's always characterized them. Um, so I don't know. It, I, I must say it doesn't look good. Uh, on the other hand, the opposition is far greater than it ever was. I mean, who was the, who was the intellectual opposition in the, in the 30s? I mean, you had Mises in Europe, and you had Hayek. Um, you had um, Hazlitt. Um, you had Benjamin Anderson, but I mean, <laughs> Garrett Garrett. I mean, there were just a handful of people, magnificent people, but just a handful. Um, now, you know, many, many thousands understand Austrian business cycle theory. It has vast new, vast new, uh, uh, tension. Jeff Tucker distributed an article that was in Barron's today um, about the Austrians were right, even though he thought that the uh, solution advanced by the Austrians is too t too harsh, as he put it. Um, so I, th you know, I, th I think that uh, I still have hope uh, because of the, of the vast amount of uh, of uh, learning and education that's taking place. So I think there's just far more opposition. Um, the Republicans overnight, of course, are talking like us. Uh, as they always seem to do when they're when they're out of power, um, so I you know I, I think that uh, I think maybe there's a chance they're not going to get away with this, but it uh, they're certainly trying everything bad, and um, as I said in a recent column, maybe it's time to reread the Black Book of Communism just so 
we all realize why we don't want Obama to go where he seems to be headed. Yes. Uh, my, my mom articulates a view that I think is actually really common, maybe not among the people at this conference, but among a lot of Americans, which is that that swing from left to right, that this is the, a great virtue of American democracy, it's moderation. You know, we, we haven't fallen into a, you know, a Soviet Union, a con, you know, Bolshevik revolution, nor a sort of a Nazi kind of takeover. We, we, we're, we're a middle of the road country, and we just gently go, you know, and this is a wonderful thing about America. I just wanted to well, so we only have like moderate Bolshevism or moderate Nazism. <laughs> Um, well, we know Mises said, you know, middle of the road leads to socialism, right? I mean, there's a, the, you, of course, and that's what's happening. Um, so that all the interventions uh, lead to more interventions to correct the interventions leading to more. Um, but this is, like, you know, I, I'm, I don't believe in democracy. I don't believe in the American democracy. Uh, I think Hans, Hans Hermann Hoppe is, uh, curious anybody who's read his great book of that, uh, of that myth. Um, but maybe this, you know, I, this may be... Uh, a common view, but we're moving, of course, towards the total state. I mean, whether it's whether it's a Republican total state or a Democratic total state. Certainly, we don't live in a free country by the standards of Thomas Jefferson. Maybe even by the standards of Alexander Hamilton. We don't, you know. I mean, we, you know, maybe even Hamilton didn't, didn't envision something quite this bad. Um, but you know, everybody's everybody's convinced that because there's a vote, things can't go too bad. Well, you know. This is the biggest, richest, most powerful state in the history of the world, the U.S. state. And of course, it's an empire that claims control over every country in the world that it wants control over. I mean, claims the right to uh, have its huge um, bottom mapping ship, um, which is designed to en enable the American killer submarines to go in without hitting any on the, anything on the bottom, uh, going 75 miles off the Chinese coast right off their big uh, submarine base. And um, of course the U.S., if somebody brought something in 75 miles off San Diego, you'd capture it or sink it or something because the U.S. says you can't do that here. But um, U.S. claims power, you know, and domination, hegemony everywhere. And seems to almost have the, the view of uh, Genghis Khan, who believed that the gods had given him control over the whole earth, and therefore anybody who was opposing him was blasphemous, as well as stupid. Um, <laughs> so the U.S. seems to believe that God has given you know the U.S. government control over the whole earth, and anybody opposing you, you don't actually have a right to oppose the U.S. It's actually a crime to um, for a country the U.S. is targeting to defend itself, um, just as Genghis Khan thought. <laughs> So this is, uh, this is an extraordinary government. Um, on the other hand, as we all know, uh, who've read uh, De La Buede and Mises and Rothbard and Hume and the others, that uh, governments all depend on the consent of the governed. And uh, that consent can change. It's, uh, there are some people who think that this whole crisis was brought on deliberately by the, by the power elite. Um, obviously, don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think they're that smart. Uh, and they're much too arrogant in their, in their belief in their power and the ability of their printing press and their guns to uh, achieve any ends. Um, but the, one of the reasons they don't, they would not bring on a crisis like this is because it's so destabilizing. Indeed, it's destabilizing for the whole regime. So this is another reason to be optimistic. Um, the climate of opinion can change, and when it changes, uh, changes can change very, very quickly. So, you know, this is why we need to keep up, why you all, why you all need to keep teaching, uh, we all need to keep writing, and um, I think we're having an effect. Now again, there's always a, a fight between power and market, as Murray said. Um, we just have to keep fighting for the market. I agree with you that uh, the crisis is quite destabilizing, but isn't that kind of what the government wants? I mean, Rahm Emanuel obviously wants destabilization, he wants no, and of course, the, you're right. I mean, governments also love crises. Uh, they love 9-11. They should have like a holiday, a government holiday for that. They just, <laughs> you know, because of course, they, they're the only, every state would like to be a totalitarian state, although my guess is they've actually learned they don't want uh, public ownership of the means of production because it means they're all poor too. 
So I think they've learned that. But other than that, they want a totalitarian, uh, a fascist state, in other words, a public-private. Um, but the reason they, we don't have it um, is because of public opposition. But when public opposition withdraws, as it did after 9-11, then, of course, the state immediately expands. So they love crises, and they love this, you know, this present crisis uh, for that same reason. But it's still destabilizing because it makes them look bad. And also, one other point of uh, optimism, um, you know, Tom Woods's book, um, and I think, you know, the work of Ron Paul and the work of Rothbard and Mises and so many others have helped, for the first time in history, target the Fed. I mean, people are actually aware of the Federal Reserve. Uh, when I was a boy, you, the Federal Reserve was just a name on your bills, and it was, you know, supposed to make your eyes glaze over. Pay no attention. You know, it's boring. Of course, the fact that you're being ripped off is actually very interesting. <laughs> and, and, you know, millions are aware of the Fed and hate the guts of the Fed. Uh, this is why Alan Greenspan wrote that article in the Wall Street Journal, say, don't blame me, don't blame the Fed, you know, it's the Asians or whatever, you know, whoever. <laughs> they loaned us too much money, that was the trouble. <laughs> so, um, there's... Again, reason, reason, to be, reason to be optimistic. Um, again, because people are aware of the Federal Reserve. Uh, many Americans hate the Federal Reserve. I think this is, an, uh, this is increasing. And of course, it's important to target the, the, the villain. And the villain of the piece is, of course, the Federal Reserve. Um, you're not supposed to even know about it, think about it. But So I think that worries them. I think that animated Bernanke speech, who, you know, he again says, it's not us. Federal Reserve always cures the crises, but never causes the crises. That's the rule. Believe it, think it, you know, that's it. Well, the reason, why are they saying these things? They've never ever, you've never seen a Fed chairman, Arthur Burns or whatever, ever defend them to the Fed like that. It's because of us. So, very good. Mark, how's our, we done? Is that it? Thank you very much.